Hey, welcome to another episode of the Fit Growth Machine Podcast. I'm Brian Roisintool, your host, and today I'm going to interview Ash Musavian. He's been uh, in the commerce space for six years now, and is currently the agency partner manager at Tapcart, a company that turns Shopify sites into beautiful mobile apps. Before talking to him, let me tell you that this episode is brought to you by BSR Digital. At BSR Digital, we help e-commerce brands that want to scale their business to the next level through paid ads and email marketing. Yes, even after the iOS 14 update. Now more than ever, we need to understand that it's really important to level up the marketing and design a solid strategy as what used to work doesn't anymore. So if your e-commerce brand lacks a solid plan and professional team to increase sales, we can help the same way we have helped more than a thousand brands like yours for over a decade. To learn more, you can visit us at bsrdigital.com, or you can also email us at hello at bsrdigital.com. Now, as promised, I have Ash here with me. Thanks, man. Thanks for being on the show. Oh, it's a it's my pleasure to be on it, Brian. Uh, longtime fan, really excited to be here and joining you today. Thank you so much for giving us the space. Yeah, it's my pleasure, man. So why don't you start by telling the audience more about you and your story? Oh, would love to. So um, I guess my journey in e-commerce started uh, back in Toronto when I had joined a full digital agency called DMAC Media. At the time that I joined it, I joined as an account manager. But if anyone listening has ever been in the agency world, you know that you quickly wear all sorts of different hats. And it was a fantastic experience. I was working there for over three years. Um, quickly learned to hate Magento and love Shop- Shopify. Uh, we were platform agnostic. I got to play around with a lot of different platforms, work closely with merchants. Um, but then I decided the best way for me to go is to choose one platform and kind of narrow my focus. With that, I um, decided to join Shopify, uh, join them as a senior merchant success manager. Just the opportunity to work with over 60 different merchants in my book and just learn directly from these entrepreneurs was just such a fascinating experience. Like going and diving deeper into their problems, the, the particular solutions that we would look at together and just helping them advise them. Um, throughout that process, one of the things that I did quite frequently was asking them, hey, what are the solutions you're really excited about? What are the things that like are delivering value for you? And that was the way that I started getting introduced to TapCard. Um, and uh, I ended up creating, a, I was very inquisitive. I was asking questions trying to figure out what TapCard and mobile commerce was all about. And uh, the COO at the time reached out and uh, long story short, it was like, hey, we just got uh, our funding of Series B. Shopify is now a believer. They're our biggest investor. Do you want to join the team? And uh, I ended up joining the team as a agency partnership manager. And now I'm here. I love that. You've been, I mean, in this space since the good old days, right? Even before oh, yeah. the, uh, algori- the algorithm change in 2018, I think it was, where the organic uh, reach decreased a lot and then, well, pre-IOS 14, 15 and so on, right? So uh, if- I, I think that was crazy. I was actually talking to you about it before we started recording. I remember, like, we were promising when I had joined uh a 10 per 10x ROAS at the time where we joined. Like, gone are those days, days of just going after new uh, acquisitions, and it was it was really easy, and it was um, just an incredible investment. Yeah, and it's interesting that you mentioned ROAS because you know even if we wanted to get a 10x ROAS, 20x ROAS, or 5x ROAS, whatever that be, the conversation has shifted a little bit, right? Companies are not talking about ROAS that often as they used to, but instead they are talking about how they can level up their game, how they can level up the acquisition and retention efforts, right? And how they can, uh, in the end, grow their business and increase revenue, increase profits, right? Yeah, no, precisely. But, you know, it's it's funny because in my current role, I speak to um, about 12 or over a dozen agencies a week, right? And it's always been really interesting seeing the difference when I hop on calls with merchants 
versus agencies. And at the end of the day, like you're expecting these agencies and experts like yourself to be ahead of the game when it comes to some of the merchants, right? You, surely you have certain merchants that are well, uh, very knowledgeable and know exactly where everything is going. But you can often be caught doing the thing that comes easier to you, you're more familiar ver with versus the thing that you should be doing. And I'm totally biased because my tool is clearly <laughs> a tool that's focused on retention, but specifically with every other um, thing that's come out, like every report that's come out about the climate that we're facing in 2023, whether that's the Shopify trends report that just came out like near the end of Q, uh, Q4 or any other th article or thought that I've read, retention is so important. But after you actually see what merchants are more eager to invest on, they still are doing what comes naturally, which is like focusing on acquisition. So when they're hitting tough times, it's really interesting how many different conversations I've been a part of where an agency, um, a merchant wasn't able to hit their BFCM numbers. And one of the first things that they cut was their retention marketing. And my mind's blown by that. It's like, how would you go about doing that? Like, where is the logic there? The shiny new thing is not always the best thing for you to invest your money on. These are people that have already purchased from you. Uh, so it's going to be way easier for you to target them and get more value out of them as opposed to someone that new. I agree. You know what? You know, I come from the background of, uh, I have a background in computer science and I used to be a developer. I keep the glasses, you know, for those who are watching the, the video version. And, you know, Back the back in uh, 2011, I um, we 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 had a, a startup in the tech and marketing both you know um, uh, industries, and it was about the early days of loyalty programs. But mm -hmm. on the back end, it was all about trying to match who bought what, right? So the profile of those you know, customers that bought certain things to make them come back. And we were going to each location, you know, to each potential customer to say, you know, you should be, after, you, you should be, you know, uh, marketing your existing customers so they come back for more. And it, it was like the era of Groupon and all those, you know, <laughs> aggressive acquisition, you know, platforms. So it was all about doing 80, 70 or whatever percent of, uh, I mean, in their in their prices to uh, to actually acquire new customers, and then they, they didn't even care about the current customers. And I was pushing and pushing for it to be successful because I was convinced that that was the way. And fast forward 2023, after COVID, supply chain issues, recession, iOS 14, 15, and so on updates. And now we are going to talk in a sec about iOS 16, right? But mm -hmm. it was a lot going on, and for the first time ever. As we have discussed in previous episodes, many commerce owners are talking about loyalty, retention, and they don't know what to do about it. As you said, they say, oh, all I need is more, more customers. Brian, I need more customers. Says, yeah, <laughs> your best new customer is your existing customer, right? If you're not, if you're not doing anything to increase your average order value or increase the lifetime value, if you want to decrease the time between purchases as well, right? You're not going to be successful as a brand, right? Because the acquisition costs are getting higher and higher, right? I mean, that's precisely it. Like, it's, it's very simple. If you continue to think about it, it's like acquisition costs have continued to climb. And transparently, take a look at the number of merchants that are actually first of all, evaluating what the lifetime value of their merchants, uh, their, their customers are. A bunch of people don't even know that, right? Um, then the, the second factor is, if lifetime value has an increase and cost of acquisition continues to increase, what happens to your margins? You're eating into your margins, right? So it's critical for people to start increasing the lifetime value. And if you're not doing that, then you're making life more difficult for yourself. But what happens if you do increase lifetime value? Well, if you do increase lifetime value, that uh, would make it more, like your finance team is not gonna have any issues with the increase in prices for cost of acquisition, right? 
And what could also happen in the ideal world, and I know I'm kind of looking at the silver lining here, everyone's upset about cost of acquisition going up, but if you're the best uh, of, the, of your competitors who is able to increase your lifetime value, then that could be a moat that you just created for yourself, right? Whereas they can no longer afford to bid for those uh, keywords and go after acquisition as aggressively as they were previously, you can because you've worked on increasing the value of every single one of those uh, users that is acquired. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, I agree. So retention, right? It's a mm -hmm. big deal. So what can brands do about it? I know you mentioned, and I'd love to know more about it. Shopify released the trends for this year, right? So what did mm -hmm. they say? I mean, it's a fantastic report. And um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe by the end of this week, they actually have a Q&A. So if you haven't registered for it yet, I'll be happy to send over the link, register for it and join the Q&A. Um, there are certain sum ups that I'd like to kind of go over, right? Um, one, obviously there's a whole concern about um, the fact that users are going to be buying less and less frequently. Uh, and the AOV uh, for those purchases are going to also decrease. Um, you're having a lot more expenses for your merch as a merchant when it comes to uh, being able to get um, funding as well. That, that's becoming more difficult because now you have less lenders that are willing to lend money. Um, so cash flow becomes a major issue. Um, beyond that, what you're seeing in terms of trends is that everyone is focused in on increasing the, the experience or improving the experience of your customers, particularly returning customers, because they did a bunch of different studies. And the gist of it was that um, even a customer that's somewhat loyal to a brand is way more willing nowadays to switch to an alternative given a discount or given a particular promotion, right? So if we are able to create more of an affinity with the with the brand with your best customers you're you're going to detract or reduce their need or urgency for them to go to your competitors because at the end of the day the other things that you see that are positive is that customers are way more conscious about who do they choose to uh, buy from and what are like some of the values social values in, that the brand stands for right so if you see them being um, conscious in terms of like the environment or various other causes or concerns that your, your, your audience has, and you're able to meet those things, then the likelihood of them wanting to go to an alternative is way less, right? So it's critical for you to create some sort of special feeling, exclusivity, something that's going to keep your returning customers coming back and keep them in the know. And this is where Tapcart really shines, right? Because the mobile app was a, a, a massive undertaking before, right? It would have required six months of um, development. It would have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And trust me, I've been there actually hearing uh, different tech partners talk to my merchants and tell them it's incredibly easy. But then when you actually came to implementing the tool, it was a pain in the butt. And I, I can totally get the reason why if it's a net new tool for a merchant, people will be hesitant. One of the reasons why I ended up joining this company was because of the fact that I was involved in the implementation process um, several times as a Shopify MSM for my merchants. And I saw that legitimately we get, we say we get the users up and running as quickly as two weeks, but the average is 24 days, which is still mind blowing, right? If you take a look at, the fact that we do um, unlimited number of design iterations, we're holding your hand every step of the way. And the entire thing is whitelisted and you never see Tapcart anywhere. Um, and everything is just fully branded. It's a beautiful experience. I haven't been in one of these experiences so far where like a merchant was like, oh, this, this seemed a lot more difficult than I thought. Everyone's really blown away by it. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I mean. We have a few clients in the agency that uh, have their mobile app. Man, we didn't know what to expect in the beginning, and it works 
really, really well. I would dare to say that half of their sales, and they sell a lot, come from the from the from the app. So why do you think that is? Why do you think brands nowadays need an app to level up their retention? Um, because many many e-commerce brands uh, listening to this or watching this episode might be thinking, "Hey, probably it's the right move for me," but is it? Great question. I think there are certain things that you could look at to first figure out whether or not like we should even have the conversation. And I think this really bleeds well into the iOS 16 update, which we'll get into in a moment as well. And there's two major changes that are taking place that merchants need to be aware of, right? Um, now, which merchants are well suited for a mobile app in the first place? So I think the key thing to note here is that we're generally a retention tool, right? Um, so it's important to recognize that generally speaking, there's two ways of thinking about it. If you're a mature brand that's, um, seeing that your, your returning users represent 20% of your returning, uh, your total purchases for the year, that's already a huge indicator that you're, you're well suited. Obviously what goes along with that is that if you take a look at your sessions by device type. Um, you'll see that the majority, 60% plus, are using mobile apps. If that's not the, the fact, then there's no point talking to you. And it, don't get me wrong, there are certain brands that are still in that category. So, for instance, there are some rejuvenation uh, creams that only geared are targeting people that are above 65 years old. So if that is the case, we're not a good fit for you, right? Because you're going to see mostly people purchasing from desktop. But if you're not the anomaly, everything is steering towards mobile. Like I think in Black Friday, Cyber Monday, the Shopify report indicated 73% of all purchases happened on mobile. So it's clear that that's the direction that we're headed. And I guess the other aspect of it that really helps illustrate this is this year was not a really good year for <laughs> tech. A lot of different tech companies ended up not having to do major cuts. Um, but because of the fact that we're in both uh, retention and mobile, Tapcart did really, really well last year, and we're, we're continuing to hire more. But going back a step, the things that you look for are, as I said, um, you're seeing your returning customers uh, representing uh, at least 20% of your sales. And then beyond that, you're seeing the majority of your customers actually leveraging mobile to interact with you. Um, other things that are important is the nature of your products, right? If you have replenishable goods and or you have a deep catalog, that makes it that much better, right? If you're just selling just couches and you haven't yet expanded your product line to include throw pillows, I don't know, accent chairs, whatever, so on and so forth, to just really increase the product line. So you have a good reason for people to keep coming back to your store, whether that's product drops, content, right, or uh, you have special promos, then a mobile app might not be best suited for you. But if you do have that and you're focusing on people continuing to interact with your brand, then we should definitely have a chat and you should reach out. That's great. So um, you mentioned iOS 16, right? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to hear it. I mean, I'm tired of iOS 14, <laughs> iOS 15. I don't want to 16, right? Please bring me good news. What are the good news? <laughs> so there are some good news, right? I think, um, look, at the end of the day, we got to take a few steps back and recognize why Apple is doing everything that it's doing. And then it's trying to create a better user experience, right? And it's trying to protect us as individuals. At the same time, some of these changes that are taking place, despite the fact that they're trying to target spammers, they do impact merchants and brands who are trying to communicate to their users, right? So there's two major changes that are taking place um, that I think everyone should be very well aware of. Number one is how are um, abuse cases, and I'm using quotation marks here, uh, being reported to uh, being reported, right? So previously what would take place before iOS 16 is that there would be a direct line of communication between the brand and the user. So if you were to respond and say stop and indicate that this was a, a feeling as if it's spammy, then that would be directly reported to the brand. 
and then the brand would obviously take the steps to get that person out of it and avoid any complication. Now what's taking place is that that report junk is being communicated to the mobile carrier. So the same way as, remember how this happened with um, like email providers? And as soon as you, you're, you get a certain number of complaints, now you're blacklisted and, and going forward, you're, you're flagged as a spammer and certain campaigns are dropped and you can't meet those, um, like you can't meet your campaign demands. The same thing is gonna happen over here, right? So you gotta be very careful about how you go about communicating with these folks. The second change is that um, same way that it happened with email previously, it's very easy now, and they're gonna roll this out uh, in, in, in the coming weeks, is that you're going to see um, filters and how they're being processed. So now you could quickly put your spams into the promotions tab. And the same way as promotions tab really do a good job of hiding all the messages that are coming in from brands if you don't want to see them, the same thing is going to happen with SMS. The, one of the biggest advantage of SMS was that you're able to get a ridiculously high uh, open rate, right? So as we're talking to different agencies, we're talking to different advisors, the general estimate is that once this actually goes live, you're going to see 30 to 35% drop in open rates um, in, when it comes to SMS, which is pretty significant. Particularly if you take into effect that you, you take into account that SMS is something that you're paying for, right? And this brings us back to why do you want to invest in a mobile app in the first place? So let's pretend that you are one of the uh, uh, merchants that fits within the criteria that we described earlier. The reason why you're looking at a mobile app is two things. One, we're a marketing channel, right? And at this point, <laughs> we're going to be your best bet for a marketing channel because um, we have uh, push notifications that are going directly on the phone of the individual, whether it's a locked screen or an open um, phone, where you're getting content rich images that are immediately being sent to them. Um, our click through rate already is above SMS and email. It's seven times email. It's more than double SMS and it's only going to get better. And the beautiful part about push notifications is that it works within apps, within Apple's uh, ethos, right? It, within their um, playbook, because we're using it, we're an app that you downloaded off of Apple. So it's not as if your ability to send push notifications is gonna go away. And the other aspect of it is that it's free and unlimited, right? Whereas with SMS, you would have to pay per send with push you have unlimited access to it and we don't gate you in any way, shape or form. So we covered up the fact that it's a marketing channel, but it's also a sales channel. Now, the same way as why is Shopify payments, for instance, the smoothest, fastest payment processor that you can have access to on Shopify because it was built for Shopify. Um, the same thing is apparent when you take a look at mobile apps versus the mobile web version of your site. I'll take the Pepsi challenge any day of the week. We're gonna be faster than your mobile web experience. We're gonna be uh, notably faster. We have less clicks to check out and it's gonna be a better UX and UI. And that's why we're seeing at least a 40% increase in conversion when you're comparing the mobile web versus the mobile app, as much as like 3X the, the, the conversion rate. So like the numbers are in, we're really excited about what took place in BFCM. We saw on average a 20% increase in AOV, and we saw on average a 40% uh, increase in conversion rate. Um, so these are the ways we're able to help these merchants grow, particularly as we look at creating a unique experience for returning users and rewarding these folks for coming back to you. Yeah, that's very interesting. I don't know if what I'm going to say is exactly accurate. I'm just thinking about it. So to you and to all of you listening or watching, my apologies if some of the things I'm going to say are not accurate, but I'll do a brief description of the last few years uh, in terms of the trends. You know, we had COVID and the, there was a boom in e-commerce. We all know that by now, right? But then iOS 14 hit 
in early, I think it was late April, 20, April 26th, 2021 or something like that. And 2021 probably was the battle of the tracking and the attribution and how to track things off the platform because the platforms weren't as accurate as, you know, they used to. So it was all about, you know, getting your house in order with regards to the mm -hmm. events priority on Facebook or uh, similar things on Google and get probably a middleman, a tool like, I don't know, Triple Whale Harrows or Rocker Box, North Cream to mention uh, uh, some, you know, but mm -hmm. then 2022 was probably the year where it was the recession, the iOS 14 or 15 uh, update uh, hit uh, more. And then brands realized that they needed to do a level up on the retention more than ever, right? Because the numbers weren't there. And now they're mm -hmm. slowly seeing that they need to do that even more as well as doing a level up on the creative side of things because the audiences are getting smaller the automation for the audiences and the optimizations are in, I mean, are a commodity right now. Every agency mm -hmm. or every brand can target the same audiences, but they need to level up the messages. And the mm -hmm. retention is way, way more important as before. And things have been changing throughout the last few years, as I said. And now things are going to change again for SMS. So if you're listening to what Ash is saying, is that the same way things have changed during the last few years, things are about to change again. So your SMS game might be working really well right now. We don't know how it will play out in the next few months, but things are going to change. So if you're not ready, <laughs> you better be and follow uh, his advice. Uh, so do you, do you agree with, with what I just said? Do you have anything to add or to change probably? Look, I, I think one of the biggest things that I'm really thankful for, for being on this show and just being able to talk to you, Brian, and just being able to educate because at the end of the day, um, what I'm really excited about is that more and more people are learning and understanding. I think that's the biggest part when it comes to mobile commerce despite the fact that we've had like record years and we're now processing over 2 billion um, transactions on uh, TapCard, um, I would say that we're still only looking at about 2% 2, 2 of the overall market. And I'm considering us and other mobile developers that are in the space. The, there's so much opportunity for growth. And I think the biggest part that is a question mark in a lot of different merchants' minds is that, hey, am I big enough for this? Hey, um, is this going to be too complicated for me? Is this, is this is completely new. How am I going to be able to convince my bosses and or investors about investing in such a huge uh, investment? You'd be shocked once you start actually taking a look at it, at like how easy we've made it for you to have your own mobile app. And the biggest other part that I think it's important to clarify is that we are currently um, the only mobile app developer out there that also allows for customizations in app for our merchants. And the key other part that I think we need to address is that, look, even if you have the best solutions out there, oftentimes merchants don't have the, the time to dedicate to getting the best out of that app or that tool. Right. So if they're only getting like 20 percent or something like that uh, usage out of an app, then they're not going to see the results. Right. One of the things I'm really, really proud of at TapCard is our customer successes team um, in general, their ability to coach and guide merchants throughout this process and the ever extending group of uh, agency partnerships that we've created where they're able to step in and help you get the most out of your app, right? Um, and what we've often find is I have like reviews from RFT from various different um, merchants that we work with that say they need about one sixteenth of a person's time to actually have a really good app and see something like 90%, uh, sorry, within 90 days, they're able to see 20 or 30% of their overall sales going through the tap card app, right? It's incredibly easy to set up. It's incredibly easy to manage. It's just a no brainer. Yeah. 
agree 100%. So for everyone listening, where they should go to find out more about you and Top Court? Um, great question. So everything is available for you to um, just take a look at the site. If you'd like to leverage this podcast and get a special promotion that's coming through our partners, um, feel free to reach out to ash at tapcart.com. Um, it's the simplest way to get a hold of me. Obviously, Ash Musavian on LinkedIn. Feel free to ping me if you ever want. Um, I'm available to just chat through things and just make sure that this is the right tool for you. You can obviously also take a, take a look at tapcart.com and request a demo. Uh, going through me, because of our relationship with Brian, I'd be happy to extend to you guys uh, a special promo um, where you would get 60 days free and you'll even get Insights Pro, which is an additional tool that we offer for the first 12 months for free. Awesome. I appreciate that. I mean, Ash, it was a true pleasure to have you on. It was definitely an interesting conversation. So I appreciate your time. My pleasure. It's always a joy chatting with you. And thank you so much for giving us the space to chat.